From New York, Hell's Kitchen and Tynette said, It's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, Billy Connolly, sports commentator Al Michaels, and primate expert Dr. Ken Glander, plus Paul Schaefer and the world's most dangerous band. And now, a ball classic all by himself, David Letterman. If tonight's show goes really well, and you, the audience, both at home and here in the studio, are really, really good, later in the program, I'm going to wedge a quarter between my teeth. <laughs> and I'll leave it there for the rest of the week. Let's see, ladies and gentlemen. Well, just about now, I guess Dan Quayle should be picking up his bronze medal for tonight's debate. <laughs> oh, hey. I saw the uh, I saw the debate Sunday night, the presidential debates. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe this Ross Perot uh, maybe should get back in the race, huh? <laughs> I'm confused. Is he in? Is he out? I don't know. You just, you just, you just don't know. Oh. Uh, President Bush, experts believe that in the presidential debate on Sunday night that President Bush did not do very well. Uh, in fact, they say if this was jeopardy for the next debate, he would be replaced by a housewife from Queens. That's what they're, that's what they're, saying. That's what they're saying about those debates. Today is the 500th... Thank you very much. I don't have no idea. Uh, yesterday was the 500th anniversary of the day that uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America. 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering this great land of ours. And, coincidentally, it was 10 years ago today that strangers first discovered my house. <laughs> What? What is it? Oh, I, oh, thank you very much. Our producer complimenting me on my bow. <laughs> on the uh, show here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Billy Connolly is with us. And from... Yeah. <laughs> and from uh, ABC Sports, our old friend Al Michaels. And, oh, we have some, uh, we have some very unusual animals. They're, they're not monkeys, they're, they're not apes, they're not chimps, they are pro-simians. These are the animals that preceded simians. They're pro-simians. <laughs> I, I don't think they've been on uh, television before with uh, Dr. Ken Glander. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now, say hello to our good friend Paul Schaefer. He's right over there. Oh, thank you all so very much. David. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's nice well, to see you. Nice I'm marvelous. It's nice to be here. Thank you at very my much. Age, did it's you have nice a nice to be weekend? anywhere. Thank you very much. Yeah. I say, did you have a nice weekend? Oh, I had a lovely weekend. Did you see the presidential debates? Oh, I, yes, I did. I was watching I the sure presidential did. debates uh, like everybody else uh, in, in my own home, and about halfway through, you forget that what we're doing here is trying to evaluate three men who want to be, one who is, and two others who would like to be president of the United States. You have to keep reminding yourself of that because if you sort of look at how they are and listen to what they say and sort of experience them for what they are, 
it's like we're picking out a, a substitute homeroom teacher. You know, that's... <laughs> you think, well, yeah, one, any one of these guys could jump yes. in and take over homeroom I for you. I guess you're right. But, but that's not it. We're looking for a president of yeah. the United States. He... Let's uh, show you the new oil painting. For the last month, we've been displaying lovely original artwork right over there on Paul's organ. We have another fine piece of art here tonight. The artist's name is Gerard Tempest. Can that be a real name? Oh, a little music there, Paul, while we unveil this. Yes, a little gallery music, and we'll show you this new piece of art. There it is. It's Cosmo... Stop it, ladies and gentlemen. You're not entitled to that opinion. The tickets were free. It's Cosmos 3, oil on canvas, $12,000. Wow, $12,000. And it comes to us from the Bergen Museum of Art and Science in Paramus, New Jersey. Ah. <laughs> they can get 12 grand for this over the there. The Bergen Museum of Art and Science in uh, Paramus, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, guess who's on the line? I have a line flashing right over here. Guess who this is? Hello, who am I talking to? It's Larry King, Dave. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Larry King. <laughs> Larry King. King. Larry, of course, star of Mutual Radio and CNN Television oh. and close friend of Ross Perot. Oh, yeah. Hi, Larry. How you doing, buddy? How you doing? Good. What did you think of uh, Ross on the debates the other night? I thought he was, he was typically Ross. He was on the money. He, uh, the reason that Ross took off so well when he started back in February on our show, he showed you the other night. That's Ross Perot. All right. And if he's elected president, there is some kind of cabinet position in it for you. Isn't that true? <laughs> Well, I've declined that. Uh, I, I can't take the cut and pay. Uh-huh. But oh. I have <laughs> Larry, uh, Larry, uh, I had another question. What about uh, Ted Turner, your boss there at CNN, and his wife, Jane, sleeping through baseball games? Well, it was 13-5, and it was late, and it was boring, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, it, it, it looks bad for them to... Just tell them to stay at home if they're going to do that. Or, or, Larry, how about this? Get a nap. Get a nap. Yeah, exactly. Larry, you know why we called you here tonight, by the way? I don't. Uh, <laughs> we were so impressed with Mr. Perot showing there in the debates that we think maybe this thing can heat up again and go all the way. But what Ross Perot and his running mate need now is a good, solid campaign slogan to kind of get them over the top, carry them these last few weeks. So tonight... Free of charge to you and, and everybody else who's interested in Mr. Perot, we're going to select a campaign slogan for him, okay? Okay. Okay, now, after we've made the choice, you hang on right here. I'll get back on the phone and tell it to you, okay? Do I, do I get to submit a choice? No, not in your life, Larry. <laughs> All right. All right, hang on. I'm going to put you on hold. Okay. All right, we'll get right back to you. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here now. We're going to select a brand new political slogan for Ross Perot. Here we go. Get ready for real TV excitement. May I have the first slogan, please? <laughs> Vote quick before he drops out again. There it is. Vote quick before he drops out again. That's our first slogan. Next, next, here's slogan number two, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Vote for parole. He'll buy everyone a pony. That's right, number two. Perot, he'll buy everyone a pony, okay? And our next slogan, please. Here we go. Hey, America, let's pull Ross's lever. Okay, this is slogan. Hey, America, let's... One moment, please. Funny! There you go. Welcome number five. Come on. It'll be funny. All right. 
Larry, are you still there? I'm right here. All right, it's coming right along. Hang on. Is the caller there? I'm here. Overland Park, Kansas. Hello. Um, let's, let's review the slogans here. Here's slogan number one. Vote quick before he drops out again. Okay, vote quick before he drops out again. That's slogan number one. Slogan number two now. Vote for Perot. He'll buy everyone a pony. That's slogan number two. Vote for Perot. He'll buy everyone a pony. Number three. Hey, America. Let's pull Ross's lever. Number three, hey, America, let's pull Ross's lever. Number four. <laughs> He's short. He's short. He's really very short. I think, that's, I think that is true. Now that I think about it, I believe that Ross Perot is shorter, <laughs> shorter than the other candidates. And finally, slogan number five. Come on, it'll be funny. Yeah, come on. There's your winner. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Nice to see you. Good job. Thank you. All right. I think that's our new slogan. Come on, it'll be funny. Hello, 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 Larry? Yes. We, we have the new slogan for Ross Perot. Now, this is going to be, we would like to see if you can't talk to your buddy Ross and turn this into the official Ross Perot campaign slogan for his run for the presidency, 92 in November. You Can ready? Can I expressly tell him that this was the Letterman suggestion? Yeah, anything you like, because this one is so good, it just seems perfect. It just seems just about right. Lay it on me. Yeah, come on, it'll be funny. That's the thing? That's the thing. <laughs> Vote for Ross Perot. Come on, it'll be funny. You know, that could work. Wait. All right, Larry, I gotta go. Nice talking with you. I'll tell you what, we need to do a uh, commercial. We'll be right back here with Billy Connolly. get to Neptune. All right. See, that would be if Larry King, Larry King hosts a radio call-in show, and sometimes people call in with odd, peculiar ideas like that. Yeah. That was me as the part of the caller with the odd, peculiar idea. <laughs> Phoning Larry King, who was just there a minute ago. Larry, I know how we can get to Neptune. Yeah. And then he would, next caller. Hello. That's right. Uh, let's see. Tonight on the program, we have Billy Connolly. Now, there's a funny guy. Billy Connolly had his own show on ABC. Also has his, uh, a show on CBS, or had, it, I think it's finished, called Billy, and uh, that's how he knew where to park every day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Larry, I got an idea how we can get to Neptune. <laughs> uh, also on the uh, show is uh, other people. Al Michaels from ABC Sports. You won't get a better, smarter, more talented uh, sports caster than uh, Al Michaels. Let's do our top ten list and then get on with the show. The category tonight... There you go. The category of the top ten list tonight, uh, top ten ways Dan Quayle prepared for his vice presidential debate. Seen here earlier on, uh, well, I guess all three of the major networks and uh, Fox and uh, PBS carried it. And CNN, Larry's uh, network there. Larry, I know how we can get to Neptune. See, if I, heard, if I was driving at home and I heard that call on the Larry King show, I'd, I'd smile and laugh. Yes. I'd say, wow, there's some kind of an idiot phoning in out there. I'd, I'd say to myself. Always funny when a yeah. guy like that. There we go. Top 10 ways Quayle prepared for the debate tonight, seen earlier right here on NBC. Number 10, learn to say rebuttal without giggling. <laughs> at number 9, had hole drilled in skull to let out some of the pressure. <laughs> at number 8, bought enough candy to last 90 minutes. Number seven, read book of inspirational stories about dumb guys who went up against a smart guys and won. Number six, bounced a few ideas off Millie. 
Uh, number five, streamlined story of time his National Guard unit was pinned down for hours by a scrappy dachshund. <laughs> Uh, number four, two words, cliff notes. Number three, <laughs> memorized really snappy comeback to that you're no Jack Kennedy line. <laughs> Remember that four years ago, yeah, Paul? So, in the, yeah. Yeah, that's a recall. Well, it was a little while ago. Yeah, four years ago in the debates. Yeah. No, no, no. Was oh, you're right, four it was. Years ago? Four years yeah. ago. Yeah, when he was uh, debating the uh, vice presidential candidate. That's right, I know Jack Kennedy. Caucus's, yeah. Uh, yeah, the man from Texas. I can't even think of his name. Lloyd Benson, there you yeah. go, exactly. You're no yeah. Jack Kennedy. And number two, reread how uh, a bill becomes a law book. And the number one uh, way Quayle prepared for the debate worked on his putting. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest is a talented actor and a very funny comedian. On October 16th, he will be performing at the Music Hall right across the street. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, in Detroit. <laughs> hey, Larry, I know how we can get to Detroit and Neptune. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the program, Billy Connolly. Billy! <laughs> yeah, sir! Billy, nice to see you. Oh, it's great to be uh, Did I have this right? You had a show there on ABC. You were in the uh, the Head of the Class show, was that it? Yes, I, I, we did that and it finished. And then... What part were you in the Head of the Class? I was a teacher. Uh -huh. I replaced Howard Hed Hesseman. That's what they took my... I, had, I used to have a beard. Right, that's right. And they made me take it off for Head of the Class. They Why said, did they make you take it off? They said they had done some research and Americans find beards sinister. Mm -hmm. So I thought, has anybody told Jesus about this? Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Good one. Exactly. Strangest thing, but now I, now I don't have it and I like it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then from head of the class, you went over to uh, CBS. You had your own show there. No, I stayed with ABC. Oh, it was ABC. It was not CBS. ABS, I'm sorry. Warner well, Brothers, yeah. Me. Did they give me my own show called Billy, and uh -huh. it went the way of all flesh. Now, what was, what was Billy about? Uh, Billy was about the same guy, the same teacher, trying to stay in America mm -hmm. and trying to get a green card I and see. all that stuff. And uh, it didn't work very well, so it's... Uh, down the Swanee, right. because they, they do this lovely ruthless thing in America, you know, they, I really like the way they work, they just say it doesn't work, gone, mm -hmm. and uh, you do, the following day you don't have your car park anymore, yeah. and, you're, <laughs> and, and your trailer, and nobody recognises you if you go down, the guy at the gate who every morning went, hi ah, Billy, how are you doing, and you got to say, yes please, identity, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a brilliant thing, because in Britain, in the same position, if you're a show in England, they keep it running forever. They say, well, we've put a lot of money in here, right. just let it run. So, <laughs> four years later, you don't know if it's funny or if it's working. It just, so, but America's funny that way. It's very ruthless. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think you are to be congratulated, uh, being from Scotland originally, I believe, yeah. and coming to this country, and your talent and popularity from your stand-up appearances gets you uh, two major network television programs. That's no small accomplishment. Yeah, but it was, good for it was this show, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg put me on her... her uh, HBO special, uh -huh. and then they gave me an HBO of my own. And so, you know, that's yeah. what's kind yeah, of... Yeah, still what I'm saying is it's uh, quite an accomplishment. Ah, uh, yeah. that's a good one. Uh, now, uh, but... So after the shows went away, you go back to traveling the road. <laughs> I'm sorry, what am I missing exactly? There? <laughs> Something humorous know. taking I, place I, I somewhere in the it. studio. Yeah, so, so I'm doing it live. This is what I've done all my life. You see, just these one-night stands yeah, of stand-up stuff, and that's what I really like doing best. What's happening? I don't know. I have, I have no idea. The audience, God bless them, has finally found it a way to amuse themselves here tonight. And they're to, they're to be congratulated on that. Very good. The so least anyway, they do is tell you what you said know, that made the, them laugh. The shows went away, and you're back out on the road. I'm doing on your, the road, yeah. yeah. I've just I've toured Canada, and I'm coming down now to do it in America. Uh -huh. It was great. Canada's good, you know. It was. I you, just, yeah. You don't mind the traveling involved with it? I show. like it. Yeah. I actually like that. I came to the conclusion years ago that if you say you hate traveling, then you're doomed because you're going to have to do it, right? So you find the bits you like and just, and the bits I like are watching daytime television and then going to work in the evening. <laughs> so just nothing. I drink tea. That's watch... the attitude that made this country great, Absolutely. by the way. <laughs> watching Geraldo, you feel so sane, you know. You... <laughs> 
<laughs> you watch people who make love to their pets all day. <laughs> guys who want to marry the furniture and you think, God, I'm OK, I'm OK. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and at night you go, you say, I exist, um, this is OK. And you go out, especially in Canada, and I collect Canadian money. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're laughing at. They can tell I've been in Canada. Uh -huh. Yeah, I collect Canadian quarters. And there's nothing infuriates Americans more than Canadian quarters. <laughs> I, I give quarters to homeless people. Have a quarter and they go, thanks. Ah! That's interesting. The man tells us of tricking homeless people, <laughs> and the audience explodes yes! with laughter. Yes! Well, it certainly is a new day here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we have to do a commercial. We'll be back with Billy Connolly. program, ladies and gentlemen, Billy Connolly is here, Al Michaels is here, and uh, Dr. Ken Glander. I've not seen these animals, but they are apparently uh, very rare, uh, very unusual, and have uh, prehistoric, I'm not, not sure that that's the correct word, but connections to earliest life. I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah. Yeah, we have an, an animal. <laughs> an animal called an eye eye. Uh, we have an animal called a, a lemur, I believe. Oh, I know what a lemur is. Yeah, and, yeah. and a couple of other, and they're generally in the category of pre-simians. Pre yeah. As I live and breathe. Yeah, so they'll... <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe they get much TV time. I don't think you've seen them uh, on Not many programs. Not a lot programs, of so stuff. Yeah. Uh, where were we, Billy? What were we talking about? We're oh, tricking the trick homeless. you play on the homeless people. Yeah. God bless you. Yes. I should do... It's getting really weird now how to, you know... Because I like, you know, I do, do my thing for the homeless people, but the, it's getting very strange. We, the last time I was here, I think it was when I was on here, yeah. we went for dinner, and we come out of a restaurant, and there was a line of homeless guys. Uh, the, the restaurant was closing, and they obviously all knew, and they all turned up and stood in a line with those... I'd never seen anything like that. It's like Calcutta around here, isn't it? Don't you think it's getting kind of strange? <laughs> Yes, it you is. You know, you have to go along. It's very, very strange. And so you have to go along. You have to go along all the cups like that. It's very, it's very weird. I know. I, I know. don't think sad. it's sad. It's sad. No, it's just it's, it's, it's odd. No, it's not. It is. It is odd. Yeah. And and sad. I think. It's so. very sad indeed, but yeah. very, very odd. Yeah. yeah. And and a great concept for comedy. <laughs> I just thought I'd say it. You're supposed to think and say things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it for a second there. I thought we were, there was more to your homeless hunk. No. <laughs> okay. Um, and then... Uh, no, I don't have a whole bit on the homeless. You no, know. I, I was surprised that you had anything on them. I did <laughs> Well, no, that little thing about tricking them with the Canadian quarters. No, it's just... Yeah. I know, it was just a joke. Yeah. See, that's the part that surprised me. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, and uh, what else will you be up to? Where do you live now? Where do you and your wife live? Are you, are you, you're not United States citizens, obviously. You're still... No, I have a green card, though. Now, I'm, what, what I'm does a that registered mean? alien. Mm -hmm. I can live here. I don't need a visa, but I can't vote. Yeah. Right. So it was so extraordinary to be making a show about trying to get a green card and I got one in the middle of it all. Well, my wife did. It was that lottery. You, you enter your name and, and bingo, she won a green card. And I, so I got one because I'm married to her. Wow. Yeah. Now, now, this was a lottery held in this country? Yes, in America. Yeah. <laughs> and you won, the, you won the green card or she won the green card. Yeah. yeah. It's, a very str it's a very odd thing. You see, I, I have a house in England and I have a house here in Los Angeles. I live there. And my wife is Australian, and she thinks that we live here mm -hmm. and we have a house in England. And I kind of think that we live there and I work here. It's a very strange yeah, thing. And I have yeah. a Portuguese family live in my house in England. And it's a, it's a very complicated <laughs> affair. <laughs> yeah, so I, I trundle merrily forward. Yeah. And, um, wow. Uh, <laughs> And the Portuguese people living in your house in England? Yeah. I'm guessing formerly homeless? 
So you've done, you've done your part there. Sure. Uh, you're going to Detroit on October 16th. That's the, is that I the end of this yes. week? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think. It's Friday night. Okay. If you're in that area or in any area, Billy will be traveling too soon to uh, do yourself a favor and try and get over there and see one of the shows. Billy, good to have you here. Nice Thanks for dropping by. We'll be right I did not. I, I tuned did in you see a little part late. of it? I tuned in late, but I saw the... the this, I the guess, was half. toward the end of the debates, uh, the presidential debate Sunday night. And... Um, I had stepped out of the room, and I thought I heard something odd, and so I kind of ducked back in to see what it was, and it was, it was strange. How, do we have that videotape? Yes, we do. Brian, do me a favor. Roll the videotape, and I think this is where President Bush is answering. I don't yeah, Watch this. There's Bill Clinton, the, the governor. This was the presidential policies, debate on Sunday so far, night. It seems to me you're pretty sound. Okay, now President watch this. Bush, you have one minute. That was the uh, Sunday night. That was the presidential debate. Why would he use up a whole minute I don't, doing that? I don't understand it. You know, there, there are so many things about life in the 90s I don't get. I don't get. understand, yeah. Tomorrow on the program, uh, Katie Couric will be here. Directing at that point, overacting. It was just um, uh, an instinct I had was I wanted to learn how to direct. Um, it was 1968, 9, and 70. And he, I had him for like four or five classes. Oliver Stone was there at the same time, and Christopher Guest, Mike McKeon, um, a little later, Melissa Manchester. Um, it was really interesting. It was, it, I think you, what I learned from him there and, and, uh, was the intensity, the drive, the overall knowledge of the camera that he has um, and had then. That was, it was a lot of basics about the actual structure of a camera and I made some films which are very embarrassing today to think that what I was <laughs> interested in um, and it was uh, he was very strong with us he was very encouraging um, but very strong with us as far as composition and sense of what we were doing and a, I learned from him a great respect for the camera and the man who operates it too it was a great respect for that in 1976, you were cast as... What are you, Ralph Edwards? This is like, uh... This is your life. This is, uh, yeah. Yeah. 1976. You were cast in All in the Family. Nut Boy. As Rob Reiner's best friend. The and Nut you Boy. went Hell on the to Nut become... Boy. Best friends. Best friends in real life. Casting. What, what yeah. binds you together today? Well, I, I would guess the the uh, the camaraderie of our of our illnesses of our, of, uh, the roses. Yeah, well, it's an illness. Um, I, we just really hit it off, you know, and we did that. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Let me bring out our next guest. Do you enjoy this man's work, Paul? Oh yes. I've known of Al Michaels for years and years when he was the voice, the radio voice of the Cincinnati Reds. Back there on WLW in the days of the big red machine. Mm -hmm. When I was living in Indianapolis, I would listen to this man every single night of the baseball season. Right. I'd listen to all 20 of the preseason games. I'd listen to all 162 regular season games. And then I would listen to all of the playoffs. You know this man's work. Oh, man, is he great. And, and baseball on radio, you're not going to get any better than this guy. He's Fine. terrific. And, and then, of course, in those days, the Reds were the big red machine. And they would go into the playoffs and they would win the World Series. What a, what a boyhood I had, but hey, it'll, it'll all be in the book. <laughs> uh, our next guest continues to be one of the foremost uh, sports broadcasters working today. This is his uh, seventh season as the play-by-play -play announcer for ABC's highly successful Monday Night Football. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Al Michaels. Al, as a uh, boyhood idol of mine, I'd kind of like to see in a tie. There you go. <laughs> As a, <laughs> you're, 17 and, you're 17 and I'm 19 when you're listening to me in Cincinnati. You were very, very young, weren't you? I mean, to have the big play-by-play -play job. I was uh, in my mid-twenties. Well, the Reds in those days, of course, uh, didn't want to spend a lot of money. Pete mm -hmm. Rose would hold out every year. Uh, Johnny Bench was holding out during those years. So they went out and they hired themselves an announcer in his mid-twenties. Got him a kid. But you, I think you came from Hawaii. You were I doing did. games in the Pacific Coast League, weren't you? I was, you? and took a pay cut. 
Is that right? I go from the minor leagues to the major leagues, and I'm sitting there in the in the office of the Reds in 1971, <laughs> and it's it's a dream come true. I'm going to be doing major league baseball yep. for a pay cut. That's right. But it was that's a great story, and also to be on. Uh, I guess the network, but also the flagship, WLW, which is, uh, right. still is a booming 50,000-watt clear channel right. station. And you're, you're driving a cab in, in Indianapolis at that time. Close enough. Listening. listening. <laughs> I was listen, holding up liquor to stores, those actually. Oh, those, those were great years. They really you were. You and Good Joe teams. Nuxhall. I know every time you're on here, I bring up Joe Nuxhall, but right. at the end of every broadcast, it was, uh, so uh, until then, this is the old left-hander. Rounding third, heading for home. And heading for home. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you talked about all of the games we did, and, and you would listen to every game. You'd listen to, we would do like four pregames and four postgames mm -hmm. because they sold, uh, oh, they, yeah. they, they sold this was, like crazy. It was baseball in, in all day. Market. So by the time we really got off the air, if the game would end at 11.30, by the time we were done with all of our postgame shows, it would be about 1.15 when Joe <laughs> would utter those words, and that would be the cue for the highway patrol to clear I-75 because Joe was coming home. <laughs> They didn't want anybody else out on that highway. Now, Joe, Joe is still on the air down there, isn't he? Is. he? I hear him from time to job. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those are great memories. But I'm telling you, it, it was really a treat. I, I mean, that was, those were great days for, for you and, and for baseball. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions about uh, this Deion Sanders deal. Mm -hmm. uh, football, baseball, back and forth. All of a sudden, it's a big deal. Some people don't care. Some people do care. Some people are unhappy. Some people are happy. What's the deal? Deion has announced that he's going to moderate the next debate. <laughs> in addition to playing both sports this Sunday. It's, it's a funny thing. I don't know why people um, uh, have denigrated Bo Jackson in the past for attempting to do something that's similar. Even though Bo didn't overlap, he would play his right. baseball, then take a week off, and then go to football. Uh, for some crazy reason, there's been a lot of resistance to what Sanders is doing. I think people think that he's doing it for nothing but the money. I asked him on Monday Night Football last night. At halftime, if he was doing it for the money, and naturally he said no, uh -huh. I have to think it's part of the equation, though. I think, look, it's a challenge. Uh, he knows he can do something that nobody else can do. It is fun in a way, and it will be worth some mm -hmm. extra bucks to him. I don't think he's doing it solely I think people for the money. resisted the idea that his shoe company kind of underwrote this project. Well, what he contends is that they asked Nike for some assistance in terms of logistics and getting him back and forth to Miami. Uh, I think what really happened here, David, is that he, he had been platooning up until the early part of September, and then Bobby Cox, his manager at Atlanta, said, this is the way we're going to use you in postseason. You're going to be a pinch hitter, pinch runner. You're not going to come into the game until late in the game. That, I think, didn't set particularly well with Dion. In fact, last night as we were testing, I'll tell you something. Well, I, I, I watched the game I was, last night, I was going to say off the record, but a few people do watch this show. Uh, <laughs> the like, next best like, thing to off the record, we're, though. We're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> it is. We're, uh, we're testing communication last night, and I'm in Washington, and Dion is, uh, is down there. It's in the commercial beforehand, so I said to him, just to make conversation and, and to test whether we could hear each other, what time does the game start tomorrow night? And Dion says, I think 8.30, but I don't have to be ready till 10.30. Yeah. So that he tells you what, what he's thinking is, yeah. about. Yeah. You know, I think what would take the edge off this situation for people, and I felt the same way about Bo Jackson and also, to, I guess, the, similarly to uh, Dion Sanders, what you really want as a fan, you want a guy to be able to play baseball and football. And, and in, in baseball, you want him to be Mickey Mantle. Mm -hmm. And in football, you want him to be Johnny Unitas. Mm -hmm. You know, you want a guy to come yeah. in there and mop up in both sports, and it will never happen. Well, Bo Jackson almost was. Not uh, you know, Johnny Unitas. Bo Jackson was almost like Jim Brown. Yeah. I mean, it was that same thing. A guy who could hit the monster home run in baseball and then... Uh, go 93 yards yeah. in football. He's about as close as we'll ever see to anything like that. Now, last night's game was a blowout. Uh, Washington chewed up. Who was it that they... Uh, Denver. The, oh, the Denver Broncos. Three. Yeah, 34-3. Mm -hmm. to It was three. a good lead in for you, wasn't it? And uh, I, was, I was listening to the game, and uh, all of a sudden, I wasn't really paying too much attention to the score. It turned in late. And all of a sudden, you're saying, and it looks like the youngest quarterback in the history of the NFL may get in to throw a pass, so stay tuned. And I thought... Man, this that's, really must be a that's, blowout. That's, that's when you get that. Well, he, he turned out to be Tommy Maddox of the Broncos, the youngest quarterback to throw a pass in the National Football League since 1946 when a man by the name of Elmer Angsman with uh, the Chicago Cardinals did it. Oh, sure. So he, he got into the game. He did that. He then became the first quarterback to have a pass intercepted since 1946. Oh, the, the kid last the night was intercepted? Yeah, he was intercepted. He threw a completion and the whole thing. This is what we're reduced to, David, at the end of the game. We're reduced to... We're reduced to probably the, the few people, or the, the several million people, clearly, who are waiting up for this show, 
and, <laughs> and, and maybe the two or three million people who are betting what you call, you know, the over and under. Uh -huh. In, in football is, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's total points. Some people bet on teams, other people bet on total points in a game. So I think the over and under last night was about 38 points. And you guys were working, though. Score is 34 to 3. Mm -hmm. It's 37 points. Washington has the ball on the one-foot line with two minutes to go. So if you have the over, I mean, you can't wait for them to go in. If you have the under, you're dying. And they, go, they do four kneel downs. That's right. Because Gibbs doesn't score. Yeah. So there was, there was some high, high drama last night at every sports book in Vegas, believe me. So, but, but when you guys are taking off the headphones and heading back to the hotel or wherever it is the hell you're going, and... <laughs> How can you, I mean, it's just the luck of the draw, isn't it? I mean, some nights are going to be like that. There's nothing you as broadcasters really can do except your best efforts every night out. You, you hope for a compelling game. It's a funny thing. Everybody thinks we root for teams. And we'll, after a game, uh, people, it's half and half. They'll think we're rooting for one team or the other. All you root for is a compelling game, a yeah. very close game, an overtime game. You know, that combination, the three of you guys, has turned out to be a really, really good, strong, entertaining, informative bunch. Well, we, I appreciate that very much. We've, uh, you know, we've been together for a long time, and you, of course, now know Kathy Lee personally very oh, yes, well. I after do. After yes, last I do. Week. That, was, that was a great <laughs> fit. You seem uh, like a very nice woman. Oh, yeah, she, she really is. No, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun off the air as well. I want to come up into the booth one night. You've got it. All right. no, we need you. In fact, I'll we have Cincinnati at Pittsburgh, and we really That's need me. you this Monday. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll be, be there. there. Uh, the creature is so rare, they have never been seen before by the general public. Is that right, never seen before by the general public at all, or never before seen on TV? Never been seen on TV. Oh, okay. So some of these animals have never been making their television debut here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here he is, the director of the Duke Primate Center, Dr. Ken Glander. Dr. Glander, good to have you here. Everybody else, what it is, what is the purpose and pursuit of the Duke Primate Center? The mission of the Primate Center is research, education, and conservation. And the more we learn about these animals, the more likely we are to be able to preserve them. And of those uh, activities, what is the most important? I guess the conservation, eh? Conservation, ultimately, but research is the most important for us because we have housed the world's largest collection of these rare and endangered persimmons. Wow, I bet you use a lot of air wick. Indeed we do. <laughs> um, and... And the animals that we're looking at here tonight, have I been explaining it sort of correctly, that these are, they predate what people think of as chimpanzees and monkeys and gorillas and so forth? You are absolutely right. Pro-simian means they evolved before well, pro monkeys. Pro-simian, I was yeah. saying pre-simian. Pre, pre meaning before, but the word is pro-simian. Okay. Now, all right, let's just uh, take a look okay. at what you have here. pro what we, what we have right here is a slender loris. Slender loris. Very long legs. Uh-huh. And notice the uh, eyes, the very large eyes mean it's, it's nocturnal. Right. And, f and from this, primates then evolved. Is that correct? Does this thing fly? Does it jump? What the... No, this is a primate. This is what the earliest primate, I'm what sorry. the earliest primate looked like. Yeah, I'm, having, I'm having trouble with what it was that these came before. They came from trues. From trues? Trues. Trues. Insectivores. Instantly. which looked a lot like this. And that's why these animals are so valuable, because they provide us with a view on what evolution was yeah. like. And are many of these left now? There are not many of these left there because their habitats are being destroyed. And where would this one come from originally? This is found in India. Yeah. And, and you'll take care of this now for the remainder of its life? Yes. How long will it live? It'll live somewhere between 10 and 15 years. And down there we have an uh, animal that's sleeping. Uh, that is a... Uh, a pygmy loris, and it, its diet is primarily insects and birds. Wow. And it is, it is sleeping. <laughs> yes. Okay. We come back to, to here, David. We've got some, some animals behind the counter here, and this animal is a fat-tailed dwarf lemur. It's a fat-tailed dwarf lemur? Yes. And her name is Diaz. And uh, if you would like, you can touch her. If you don't make any sudden movements, mm -hmm. she won't mm -hmm. harm you. All right. But her tail... Her tail is... She's called a fat-tailed dwarf lemur because her tail stores fat. Uh -huh. And this is the only primate to hibernate. And she lives off the, the fat stored in her tail. In fact, her tail will get as big as her body. Yeah. All right. And it's... 
it's at this time of year in the cold weather that they go into hibernation. Oh, watch, watch the tail. Yes, we'll we'll don't slam the <laughs> cage door on the tail of the lemur. Yes. If you would take this, David, and <clears throat> go on that over there, I'll show you one of the rarest what am, I, what am I doing with this stick, by the way? You're going to entice Poe out of this cage. What the hell is that? <laughs> If you'll hold that up to, to wow. him. Wow. This man. This is that ain't, that ain't no bunny, is it? <laughs> no. Gee. Scared the hell out of me. Man. This is AI, hey, one of the rarest and most endangered one primates in the world. Nasty looking raccoon, isn't it? <laughs> Boy, you see that thing humping around in your garbage. <laughs> That's exactly the point. That's why they're so endangered, because the people who see them kill them. They consider them to be evil, because if they point that third finger at you, they believe that you die, the Malagasy oh, people. Oh, gosh. Well, that, that, I've never seen anything like that. Now, what? help me out. What, what is it related to? What is it? Uh, what, do you, what do you do with them? Are they, do they make good pets? What do you... No. <laughs> no, they don't make good pets, but they're excellent research animals, because we don't know anything about them uh -huh. in the wild. And by keeping them in captivity, this they're is, only... This, this is the I I. I I. There are only 20 of these in captivity anywhere in the world. Wow, now he keeps, uh, well, he, 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 are they he, dangerous? No, they're not dangerous. He's very gentle. Now, he seems to be trembling. I guess that's, uh... He's uh, a little bit, uh, excited with all the people here. Come to think of it, I'm trembling a little. <laughs> uh, we'll do a commercial. Okay, Dr. Glander, thank you very much for bringing these animals up here and uh, continued uh, good luck and success with the uh, primate center down there at Duke. Uh, is, what are you feeding him there? These are mealworms. This oh. is their favorite I'll take food. a couple of those. Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of like beer nuts, aren't they? They're crunchy, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks again, and, and perhaps you can come back with uh, some other animals uh, shortly. Uh, we have to go, folks. Have a lovely evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave Letterman. Uh, what do you think? Do I look like I'm involved in trying to get the Americas cut back or something? <laughs> uh, welcome to the uh, program, kids. Today is what is today, Paul, for heaven's sakes? It's, uh, it's uh, the 15th. 15th of October? The 15th of uh, October. Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, 1986. That's right. Dead center in the middle of October. And do you know that? <laughs> Uh, today, Aldo Gucci, uh, the man who was the owner and founder of uh, Gucci, um, what do they call them? Clo Gucci leathers. Yeah, leathers. Things. Gucci leathers and uh, uh, whatever. What are they? But a store. A Gucci. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> it was a. Uh, but what is it? It's like a, a boutique. Boutique? Boutique? Yeah. Uh, anyway, this man uh, is going to prison today for. Uh, uh, he'll be moved to know that your hearts are with him. Uh, anyway, apparently he uh, failed to pay $7 million in personal income taxes. Yeah. And uh, coincidentally, he'll be uh, sharing a cell with a couple of guys convicted for selling fake Gucci bags. So I think that's kind of a... <laughs> By gosh, we're going down to Australia. We're bringing the cup home, ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, the Chicago Bears obtained the rights to quarterback Doug Flutie from the, from the Los Angeles Rams. The management of the Bears say that uh, Flutie is worth whatever price they have to pay to get him because even if he never plays a down for the Bears, he can always fit into the mascot costume. So I think that's a... He's a so you see, he's a uh, small for NFL quarterbacks, Doug Flutie is. How, how tall would he be, Paul? Oh, he's relatively small for uh, NFL uh, quarterback. <laughs> About 5'9", five five nine, 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 actually. 5'8 or 5'9". Current Forbes magazine lists the 400 richest uh, people in the United States, 400 wealthiest folks in this country. Uh, and I thought this was kind of interesting, 77 of whom are, are women. And there's some interesting facts about the females. Uh, most of them are college graduates. Most of them uh, made their money in real estate. 
and all of them have received marriage proposals from Klaus von Bülow. <laughs> Uh, Paul, anything you want to add to this nonsense before we roll here? Yes, I, I would have something to add. Mm, you're still the same. <laughs> David Letterman, you never change. Is, uh, from, uh, you're still the uh, same. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. That cat is the same. Paul, that's from uh, Bob Seger, who was, who was not here last night. <laughs> and he was not here, and I think we enjoyed him more than ever last night. Not... <laughs> Uh, we got a great show for you folks here tonight. Uh, comedian Drake Sather is here. Harvey Picar from uh, Vietnam. Do you know about Harvey? Harvey is a, uh, a curious man from Cleveland who, who writes comic books, uh, by and large, about his own life. A very interesting fellow. And uh, he'll be out here moments from now. Tom Brokaw is uh, with us tonight. <laughs> now what do we do? Oh, we're going up into our lovely studio audience. Walk this way, won't you? Thank you, nice to see you. Thank you sir. If we can raise about $40 million in, in a syndicate to build a yacht, I think we can get the cut back. <laughs> Uh, we're going tonight to do something we uh, periodically do with our studio audience. Uh, people stand up and talk about experiences they've had meeting famous people in their past. And tonight's participant, our first one is Woody Woodruff. Is there a Woody Woodruff? Hi, nice to see you. Woody, how are you? Doing? Is Woody your actual name? Uh, no, it's William. William, so you're William Woodruff. Where are you from, William? I'm from Richmond, Virginia, the uh, capital of the South. What do you, what do, you do there in Richmond? Uh, I'm a student. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to school? Denison University. I see. And you're here on a break, a vacation, or? Well, Sort of a break. We made it one. You're AWOL, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you studying there, William? Uh, I'm an art student. Uh -huh. And what are you gonna, when you graduate, you're going to become a photographer? Uh, who knows? Yeah. So you're just barely hanging on by the skin of your right. teeth. In the... uh, okay, Woody, tell us about your brush with greatness. Well, I'll tell you, I was uh, about 15 years old, and uh, I was staying at the Coral Beach Club in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And No, the Bermuda, excuse me, I knew I'd screw that. But, uh, You're anyway, lying, aren't you? This whole thing is a fraud. Safer, it's a hoax. Morley Safer was staying at the same place we were, uh -huh. and we started. Uh, they started this tournament, a whole bunch of tournaments. Golf tournament? Well, uh, there was a putting tournament, mm -hmm. and there was a Skittles tournament, and that's the one I signed up with him. Okay. And uh, it ended up that uh, I beat him. You beat Morley uh, Skittles in the finals. Uh -huh. we, uh, there were about 20 people involved, yeah. and uh, I ended up beating him. It was a kind of a weird game. And, and how did Morley take that? Well, he didn't like it too much, but uh -huh. he wasn't too upset. Do you have an embellishment for this story, uh, Woody? Well, I'll tell you, there is more to oh, this Oh, good. Dave. Thank God for that. <laughs> Not a minute too soon, either. After beating him, Mr. Safer's fury only seemed to grow with each passing day. He challenged me to one competition after another. Windsurfing, firewalking, and limbo. I easily defeated him every time. He finally left the island a broken man. His wife, however, stayed behind with me. With you, right. She stayed with Woody. Nice job. You have your choice. You have a uh, Punky Brewster shirt or a uh, Punky Brewster doll. Oh, Which would you like to have? Well, I'd like uh, the doll. Take the Punky Brewster doll. Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much, Woody. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there a uh, Patty Gardner with us tonight? Patty, where are you? Come down and pick up the keys to your Buick. Hi, Patty. <laughs> nice to see you. Where are you from? I'm from Chester, New York. At uh, Chester, New York? Yeah. Where is Chester, New York? It's about an hour upstate from here. Mm -hmm. Lovely country? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do for a living up there? Um, well, I go to college in Binghamton. Mm -hmm. what, what school? Um, SUNY at Binghamton. Uh -huh. And what are you studying up there? I'm a nursing major. Oh, congratulations. Thank do you, you find that to be fulfilling work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, how are your grades? Um, 4-0. Oh, great. So you're going you're gonna to be a very good nurse one day, aren't you? Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, you have a brush with greatness to tell us about tonight, Patty? Um, yes. About a year ago, um, I was at the Concord Hotel up in upstate mm -hmm. New York. In the Catskills, I believe? Yeah, in yeah. the Catskills. And Mark Gastineau was there with Jerry Cooney. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Cooney was... Beating up customers? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a, just and a joke. And Jerry Cooney was working out, and he let the public um, watch him. And mm -hmm. so Mark Gastineau was there. So afterwards, they were giving out autographs. And my friends dared me to go up and ask him for an innocent kiss. Mm. Well, I did go up and ask him, and boy, did he give me an innocent kiss. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Something uh, went crazy? Something yeah. untoward developed? 
Yes, but okay. today there's more. Okay. When I, <laughs> when, when I next asked him for an innocent punch in the face, he really wound up and <laughs> oh, sent no. me sailing across the room. No, no. It seems Mark never does anything halfway. Uh -huh. I guess that's why I'm his biggest fan. Oh, congratulations, Patty. Here we go. You have a doll or a shirt? Take the doll. Nice meeting you. Good luck as your nurse. Thank you for being here. You all right? Uh, is there a Rachel uh, Rosenzweig uh, with us tonight? Rachel, I hear you back here. Hi, Rachel. Nice Hi, to see you. Dave. Did I get your last name uh, correctly? Pretty good. How do you pronounce that? Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig. Well, what did I say? Pretty close. No, I said Rosen Rosenzweig, didn't did I? Oh, I thought I said Rosenzweig. Okay. What, I said Rosenzweig, didn't I? No, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you calling me a liar? Uh, where are you from, Rachel? I'm from Burlington, New Jersey. Nice to have you here. And you uh, work in Burlington? Um, no, I'm working in Pennsylvania right mm -hmm. now. And what do you do in Pennsylvania? Well, I'm a part-time Hebrew school teacher. I see. And uh, one day you'd like to be a full-time Hebrew school uh, teacher? No, I think I'm, maybe I'll, I'll deal with the kids and slowly get to that. I see. Okay. And uh, you, you have a brush with greatness to share with us tonight? In fact, I okay. do, Dave. Go right yeah. ahead. Well, when I was living on Guam... Mm -hmm. maybe... Were you actually living on Guam? Sure was. Now, why were you on Guam? We were an adventurous family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mom and dad lived there? Yep. Yeah. Yep, brother okay. too. Is, is Guam just a flat, barren island, or is it a lush tropical paradise? A lush tropical paradise. Is it's it really? Best. And the oh, humidity is, is relentless? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a killer. <laughs> okay, so you're living on Guam okay. with your family. I'm living on Guam, and we're at a fiesta one day at the beach. In Guam is sort of like something you try to get out of your throat, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> mm. Mm. And we're, we're walking down the street, and the guy hacked up a big load of Guam. And we, uh, I'm sorry, I, you know, because a lot of people on Guam watch this show, but, oh, yeah. but they get it like a week, a week late. Yeah, we yeah, do. I'm sorry. So, yeah. so my okay. apologies it's to everybody on the other phone. Okay, go ahead, Rachel. Okay, well, I was at a fiesta, and then the governor came over. Ricky Bordalio came over. Ricky Bordalio is the yeah. governor of Guam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then he came and he sat right next to me and he shook my hand. Yeah. And he introduced himself and uh -huh. he said, "Hi, Rach." And we just talked a little bit and it yeah. was it was good. Yeah. It was did, really good. Did you get the sense that he was hitting on you? Um, well. Trying to impress you with well, the fact that I'll, he was governor of Guam. But I was only 11 years old Ooh, at the okay, time. 11. But there, Ra <laughs> Rachel, there's more to this story, isn't there? Well, Dave. Not really. <laughs> but I was asked to read this, this message to you. Okay. Some stories have a simple majesty that speaks for itself and needs no embellishment. Uh -huh. We, the late night writers, stand in awe. Imagine <laughs> actually meeting the governor of Guam. Truth is indeed stranger than fiction. Oh, my. <laughs> nice to meet you, Rachel. You have a lovely smile. <laughs> now we have a, a punky booster doll or a shirt. <laughs> Which would you like? Have the doll. Have the doll. There you go. Thank you very much. Nice job, Bill. Is that it? Okay. Uh, he's telling us that he's still the same. That's right. Bob is, is still unreliable. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, see, he was supposed to be here last night. He was supposed to be here two weeks ago, and he said no at the last minute both times, and he's not here, and we don't know where he is, and we don't much care, but we're sorry we missed him. Uh, and my apologies to the folks living on Guam. I realize that was probably an ugly thing to have said about your delightful island there, but um, that's what I get paid for. <laughs> no, it's not. It just uh, was kind of a, I'm sorry. Paul, what's the deal on that shirt, for heaven's sakes? Uh, it's a sort of a Rorschach uh, shirt. Whatever you see in it, you know, that's up to you. I think I see a topless human there. Well, whatever, you know, whatever you see in it. <laughs> That's, uh... We have a, uh, an update for our studio audience. At last, uh, we heard the uh, ball game between the Astros and the Mets is uh, tied 3-3 in the bottom of the 10th. Is that... Uh, Hal, oh, Hal, this will be our director, Hal Gertner. Hal, can you uh, keep us posted if there are any uh, developments in that ball game? Yeah, Dave. Thank you very much. Are you watching... 3, three bottom of the 10th. I, I just announced that, Hal. Just in case they here. Are you watching the game in there? Sure we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but that shouldn't affect the quality of tonight's show, should it? Not at all. Craig Reynolds is up, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> he looks pretty damn good. Yeah, all right. <laughs> now, do you, do you guys have snacks in there? They're on the way. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, let us know what happens there, Hal. Our first, okay. our first guest this evening is uh, one of the most trusted men in this building. 
He is the... Give me, baby. Yes. one off. <laughs> All right, fine, Hal, fine. Uh, let us know if there are any broken bats, too, Hal, all right? Uh, my first guest this evening, easily one of the most trusted men in this building, the anchor man of the NBC Nightly News, please welcome Tom Brokaw. being here. I know that uh, you're just finishing up a whirlwind uh, trip, haven't you? A little bit. You well, came from, you were in Iceland for... I was in Iceland, and yeah. then I was in the skies of the eastern seaboard for mm -hmm. most, most of yesterday. Now, how do you, how do you, how does one get to Iceland from, uh, you left from New York? Well, there's a direct flight. Unfortunately, it leaves at 3.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. so we chose instead to go to London and then fly north from there. You fly mm -hmm. about three hours. Turns out that Iceland is 175 miles south of the Arctic Circle. It's right up there. Oh, good heavens. Now, wh was it fun being up there at all? Actually, it's a, it's a great country. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to do in the little city of Reykjavik. The food is wonderful. The people are terrific, bright, charming, interesting, very confident about who they are and where they want to stay, and they want to stay in Iceland. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the food. What kind of food is it? In a lot of fresh fish, yeah. as you might expect. A salmon? Little, a lot of salmon, a lots of uh, other kinds of fish that they catch there. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, it's essentially barren, though, isn't it? They're not, there's not much vegetation. Up no, there. that's true. D you did your geography very well in the seventh grade. <laughs> it's all very true. So it, it's it's kind of stark, isn't it? In it's appearance? quite stark. Yes, yeah. a lot of glaciers, a lot of lakes, uh, a lot of changing weather at all times. Uh -huh. They build all of their houses and then paint them very bright colors because I would expect that about mid-February it gets a little depressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you had to live uh, one place or the other, would you choose uh, Reykjavik or Guam? <laughs> Well, I'd probably, maybe, uh, I'd probably split my time between there and then vacation at Ball State or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you, uh, have you ever, have you ever been to Muncie, Indiana? I have been to Muncie, Muncie Indiana. Muncie, Indiana is a nice Indiana town. It is. Very nice place. Right. And, and, and you're nice... a perfect reflection of Muncie, Indiana. Well, I'm not, not sure of that exactly. Uh, now, now, what was going on up there? First of all, wh uh, honestly, why didn't uh, Nancy Reagan make the trip? Well, was there a thought, reason for there that? Was a, this was a working session. They didn't want it to turn into a public relations extravaganza of one kind or another. The idea was that they would come there, the two leaders would get together with their top staff, and they mm -hmm. would try to work out these very complicated and very important issues that are before the mm -hmm. world. But the Soviets are getting better and better at this business of public relations. They're going right. to open an office over here in Madison Avenue probably <laughs> in about two weeks. And so Raiza shows up with this wonderful looking fur coat, and she's out shaking the hands and kissing the babies in the Iceland swimming pools and yeah. uh, going and visiting the museums and so on. But the feeling here on our side was that if, that if Nancy would go up there, all hell might break loose and it would be <laughs> nonstop partying and... Uh... Well, the, I think the, the problem is, quite honestly, that what happens is that then all the attention shifts over to the battle between the first ladies yeah. and then we don't want to get into that kind of yeah. a war. It's tough enough with Star Wars without that kind of a yeah. Star Wars. Uh, and you met the Prime Minister? Of I Biden? did. What I kind did. of man is this? Well, he's a man trained in this country as an engineer, and he's very happy. There was, we had one day in which the motorcade of the Soviet Union went by about 15 limousines and cars and outriders and so on, and the motorcade of the United States went by in another direction. And then here comes the Prime Minister of Iceland driving his own brown blazer into the <laughs> municipal swimming pool. The Chevy blazer? Chevy blazer, yeah. driving himself, gets out, quite pleasant man with a, you know, strong Nordic accent, and he goes swimming every day. It turns out it's one of the national sports of Iceland, swimming, mm -hmm. because they have a lot of thermal pools and right. the water's very hot, and he goes down and goes swimming every day. Yeah. So I went down to the swimming pool with him. Yeah. Didn't engage in any beefcake competition, <laughs> but, I, but I thought there were a couple of things that I wanted to ask him about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because Iceland is a curious country. It turns out 55% of the people who live there believe in elves. Elves. It's the highest literacy rate in the world, mm -hmm. almost 100% literacy rate, mm -hmm. and yet 55% of the country believes in elves, and I wanted to ask is this uh, Is this origin of some kind of uh, Icelandic mythology? Well, I think it has something to do with the sagas of Iceland and yeah. so on, and when you're up there in the wintertime and you're looking around, you think, why not believe in elves? Yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> you might see a couple right. on those uh, cold nights. Now, we have some videotape. Is this you and this the Prime is, Minister? This is the Prime Minister. Okay, this is uh, fresh right. from Iceland, uh, right. Tom Brokaw, and uh, what's the name of the Prime Minister? His name is Hermansson, and I'll tell you something. Something about that percent of the people who live in Iceland, I read, believe in elves. 
Well, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, but who are we to say that there are not elves and ghosts? I have never seen one, <laughs> never been aware of one, but my grandmother believed very strongly that there were, and uh, so maybe they are, I don't uh, know. How do you feel about elves? Uh, they are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this here's, is him, the, huh? here's your prime minister. Yeah. I mean, if you want, if you want to have something to say to the prime minister, you show up at the municipal swimming pool and then crawl in the hot tub with yeah. him, where he's there every day at around noon, with his uh, hot tub cabinet, so to speak. Yeah. Interesting. Very nice. Uh, we'll uh, and I understand they're still tied at three-three at the uh, in the top of the eleventh. So we'll let you know. Of course, by the, by the time this show airs, this game will have been decided Understood. by six or seven but hours. But maybe not. <laughs> yeah, but that's right. It'd be unbelievable. Excuse me, Dave. Yes, Hal. Sorry, director. Yes, yes, Hal. Keith Hernandez is up now, Dave. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I just stepped out of the box. Okay. <laughs> looks, looks like he has something in his eye. Uh huh. Okay. Um, are you still running? I remember years I ago when I first uh, met you, somebody said right. that you ran not, only, not only once, ran but twice a day. Ran in Reykjavik. Is that right? Fact. Well, that yeah. must have been a lot Down of fun. The and the great thing about Reykjavik is I was running one day in the rain, so I crossed the street so I could run in the sun, because the weather changes is about right? every 15 yeah. seconds yeah. or so. And how far do you run when you go out? No, I don't run that far, three, four miles yeah. most days. But you do it every day? I try to do it most days, and I've run all over the world, yeah. around the wall of the Kremlin, along the... You know, the streets of Beijing, uh, through Hyde Park in Africa. Yeah. It's great. I've, you know, I've done a little bit of that. I haven't traveled nearly to the extent that you have, but those are the kind of things that you always remember, the experiences right. you have when you're running. Right, you see things close up. Yeah. I was running once in Poland, and I ran across the square in the old town square, and uh, this older couple coming at me, and I could see that the man was very puzzled by this guy in this colorful pair of shorts and running along for no apparent reason. Mm -hmm. And he turned to his wife and said something in Polish, and she looked back at me, and then she looked at him, and she said, chogging and then they kept right on going so there's a word for it everywhere wherever yeah, you go yeah um let's see oh you were on the today show last week as well i was yeah mm -hmm. and what was it uh, jane it was i was still... filling in for jane yeah. right she's I, back now i, I guess worried about the fertility quotient around that chair but it, it worked out okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah they ought to spray that thing or something i don't know um so how was that? You've been away from the Today Show how many well, years? Well, that was uh, tough. The, the alarm clock protested when I, you know, I brought it out of its little dust sack. I said, no, no, not again, yeah. not at this hour again. It yeah. was fine. The great thing about the Today Show is that it has great range. Brian says to say hello. I'll right. bet he didn't. <laughs> right. now, now, how do you, now, how do you get along with Brian? I get along with him very well. We've known each other a long time. We go back to the days in California when he was a 22-year-old sportscaster yep. who came to work out. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, so I've known him a long time, too. He's a nice guy. But he hates my guts now. <laughs> no, 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 he does. I can't imagine why. Uh, well, that's a, that's a long story, and I don't want to bring it up no, again. No, I don't want you to either. We're trying to coexist right, here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and oh, th now this thing, Tom, tell me about this. Are you, in fact, any way connected with this at all? That, what, uh, well, what we have, this is a newspaper ad that says, uh, familiar looking face up here. 50, five decades, half a century, two thirds of your lifetime. But don't worry if you hurry, you can still make something out of your life. And remember this better you than me. Happy birthday, cowboy. Yeah. It says only this advertisement paid for by a younger friend of Robert Redford. I personally don't think that he looks a day over 49, but I'm told, <laughs> I'm told that he's 50 years old. Uh -huh. and, but but uh, why put a newspaper ad? Why take an ad out for that? I wanted everyone to know. <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want this to be a fleeting impression. This there was, was some talk among his family and friends about maybe getting an airplane. I said, but you know, that'll last 15 seconds. This is permanent. Yeah, yeah. That's there in the records. So you just wanted to do what you could to what, punch a hole in this man's career. This. <laughs> I got a. I, I have a letter from this man who's a great friend. Are uh, you guys friends? Well, he's, well, we used to be. <laughs> I guess they'll no longer be staying at the big house at Sundance, but apart from that, <laughs> the letter said simply, you win this one, but I wouldn't go out alone for a uh -huh. while. Well, uh, but now, now, this is insane. Now, uh, you and, 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 and Robert Redford go, go out together and do things together? Well, we don't go out in quite the way you No, no, I, I, mean, I, don't, know. I, I don't mean that. I but that. I mean, I mean, can you... you so he's so turned middle age, but he's not desperate. <laughs> <laughs> well, he could do a lot worse than right. you, Tom, believe me. Uh, But I'm, I'm saying, can you imagine you're sitting in a restaurant somewhere, or a bar, or even a shoe store, and in comes not only Tom Brokaw, uh, the NBC News anchorman, but Robert Redford. That's got to be an overwhelming first impression when you guys enter a facility. 
Well, the shocking part is when we get in a big argument about who's going to pay the bill. Uh -huh. And that's the part that always catches <laughs> Yeah. We actually went bowling in Heber City, Utah last year. <laughs> no, you See, didn't. We did. After a day of skiing and off to a Mexican food restaurant, our families get together from time to time, and we spend a lot of time together. You're, you we know, went, actually went bowling. And at the end of the evening, as I went up to pay, no one had said a word. We bowled a couple of lines. As I went up to pay, lady in curlers behind the cash register, no one had, had acknowledged our presence. Just finally said, what the heck the two of you doing here anyway? <laughs> yeah, well, see, yeah, you shouldn't be allowed out together. You know, that's the deal. You should go out singularly, but not together, because that's, that's just too much. Uh, and, and Robert rented his own shoes and stuff? He did rent his own shoes. Had a little... This guy walking around in rented shoes? With a little, with a little, with a little blue light to make sure they're germ-free. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're living a storybook life, aren't you? You really are. Hey, I'm here on the Letterman Show, aren't I? Well, there are some drawbacks. Um, Tom, uh, great go. to see you again. One thing, yeah. I want to congratulate you on winning the Emmy. Oh, that stop. Was not good. 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 But gosh, you've got a lot of writers. Dave. Well, that's I mean, they the... fill up the stage, yeah. and this is the best that they can do. I mean, oh, Tom. Good, uh, good luck getting out of the studio. All right. Nice to see you. Tom. Well, the faces may have changed, but one thing remains the same. The best musical then is the best musical now and forever. A chorus line on Broadway. Now starring Teen Beat's hunk of the month, Chris Elliott. A chorus line. Now and forever. <laughs> Looks pretty good. Glad to see it. It's beautiful. Uh, coming up in this half hour, you're going to meet uh, comic book author Harvey Picar from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Drake Sather from Seattle, uh, Washington. Uh, Hal, how are we doing in the ball game? Still three three, Dave. Three three. What inning? Bottom of the eleventh. Bottom of the eleventh. Okay. Tomorrow on the program. Uh, Dave. Yes, Hal. Three hatches up. Okay. Uh, yeah, he just stepped out. He's knocking some dirt off his spikes. Okay. <laughs> and knock some dirt off your spikes, Hal. Uh, <laughs> You know, Excuse me? No, 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 nothing, Hal. <laughs> you, uh, no, no, you go back to your corn dogs and beer, Hal. Don't, don't, uh, don't let us interrupt anything out here. Uh, tomorrow on the program, model Paulina Poritzkova will be joining us, filmmaker, author John Waters, and singer Bonnie Raitt. Yes. Bonnie Raitt will be here to sing with the band, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, just like we enjoyed Bob Seger singing with the band <laughs> two nights ago in our exactly. dreams. We enjoyed it. Uh, we have a list here, uh, top ten items. Tonight's category, top ten ways Dan Rather could conclude the CBS Evening News. You know, when, when he's finished with the Evening News, Dan Rather always says, courage. That's courage. what he says now. Uh, we have top ten ways he could conclude the CBS Evening News besides saying courage. As always, compiled at the home office in Milwaukee. Moving the first of the year, though, Paul. Do you know where? No. Oh, you know. The home office is moving? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes, they're What moving. am I going to do? They're going to 10 No, I know. I know where they're going. Yeah. Where? Tempe. Oh, Tempe, uh, Arizona? That's right. Here we right. go. <laughs> Number 10, put finger in cheek, make cork popping sound. Number 9, pretend to sweep up spotlight on floor. Number 8, say nighty night and put head on desk. Number 7, reveal which news story of the evening was the fake one. Number 6, lick lips and say, mmm, mmm, time for pie. Number five, give coded message to Lil Newshounds fan club. Number four, wink and say, pour the gin, Lydia. I'm on my way home. Number three, hurl sweat-soaked scarf to female fans. Number two, light big cigar and say, ha ha, see you tomorrow, suckers. And the number one way Dan Rather could conclude the CBS, uh, CBS Evening Newscast, feed carrot to CBS News Bunny. We'll be right back. Guest tonight works as a file clerk at a Cleveland hospital. 
He also writes comic books which deal with his day-to-day -day pains and pleasures, and this is an anthology of the nine of those comics. It's entitled American Splendor. From off the streets of Cleveland, folks, please say hello to Harvey P. Carr. Harvey, come out here. Hi, Harvey. You have to come around here. Good. Uh, what, do mean, what do you mean calling me curious, you know? I mean, I've met you before the show, you know, and, uh... I meant curious yeah, yeah, in, in a know. fascinating way. Oh, all right. A man who has, has, has the presence of one who is quite fascinating. Okay, because I met you before the show. I thought you were know, a pretty nice guy, you know, and... Yeah, well, I think I thought you're... Made him, you know, like, you might, I might be uh, nursing a viper in my pussy. <laughs> no. you know, something like that. You're a little Get defensive about this, huh? Yeah, yeah, man. Okay. I'm waiting for those Cleveland jokes, you know? Go ahead. All right, settle down, Harvey. Yeah, all right. I'm <laughs> now, uh, now let's let's explain to folks who may not be familiar with your work what it is you do here exactly. You have uh, comic books about you in That's your right. daily life in Cleveland. That's right. And uh, are they embellished at all, or is it pretty much no, factual? It's, it's all true. Dude. Uh huh. It's all true. Yeah. And how long have you been doing this? What writing comics? Yeah. Well, for about fourteen years. Mm -hmm. That's uh, you know, but I've been publishing my own stuff for about eleven. Yeah. And, and you also have a regular job in Cleveland working at a hospital. That's, that's right, yeah. that's right. Now, it, it seems to me that aiding you're... Aiding the sick, yes. Aiding the sick. Well, that's certainly noble work. Thank you, yeah. thank you. But it seems to me, Harvey, that uh, you have a very successful career here. This is being published by a major publishing company, Doubleday. That's right. And, and uh, why, why do you maintain the day job? To make a living. <laughs> uh, I don't make a living as a writer. Yeah. I've been writing for many years, David. Maybe more years than you've been alive. <laughs> you know, and I, uh, yeah, I know. I know that my youthful appearance belies, you know, my actual age. Yeah. But uh, I've been around for a but long I, time. But I have a feeling, though, if you wanted to, you could probably get by on what you make selling your, your work. Because I know people are after you to write other things, and you're, you're publishing this anthology. What, do you mean, who, what people? What people? What are you talking about? Well, well I, I know that. Get that stuff I know out. that you. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you know that uh, I'm no showbiz phony. I'm telling the truth. Now you, Come on, man. Now you can't. <laughs> I don't want to make you look bad. Tell you me you I'm... mean to tell me that other people haven't contacted you about writing literary criticism for various publications? Well, I mean, you know, like a you few... could make a living as a writer. What are you talking? What do you mean? How do you know all that stuff? I can't. <laughs> I've been writing. I've been writing since I was 19 years old, man. I'm now 47. For nationally, you know, you don't believe me. I'm eight years older than you, mm -hmm. man. I don't look it, man. Mm -hmm. You look eight years older than me, man. You look bad. I look bad. You look bad compared to me. Yeah. I look bad compared to yeah, you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the hairpiece. The yeah, well, okay, now this let's... is mine. No. Not that much, but uh, <laughs> it's all mine. All right. I don't rely on any, you know, prostheses or anything yeah, like I that. Know. That's I a technical know. word. Ha have you thought about no. a decaffeinated coffee? <laughs> 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 Next thing you know, it's going to be, you know, like your analysis. No, 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 come on. Now, but I'm serious. You, you have the magazine. I can't make a living okay. at it. All right, right, you can't make a living. I can't make a living at it. I can't make a living as a writer. But see, I think maybe, and this is only me conjecturing here, that what you're unwilling to get, uh, you don't want to lose the daily activity and the daily contact with ordinary yes, people. Yes, that's right. So it's not so much Who'd the you money. Find that out? It's not so much Must the money. somebody briefed you on me. <laughs> It's it's not so much it's it's not so much that you you can't get by without the day job. Right. You just you like the contact with the I everyday people. I can't get people. by without the day job. Okay. That's the God's truth. Right. I can't. What do you want? You know, like when I was writing for Dombey, I was getting like four bucks for a record review. Okay. okay. A lot of people I write for, I get nothing. For. <laughs> I wrote. I finally had a book review in the New York Times. I got two fifty for it. Okay. Right. Well, I, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. I'd probably queer myself at the time. Okay. I know, like, Okay, now let's, right. All right, let's go on to other matters. You, right. You've proven your point, and I'm sorry if I all touched right, the source spot. That's okay. Bottle. No, it's all right, David. Okay. I'm a big man. I can shrug it off. All right, now good. <laughs> um, now, you, uh, the, the, the people you work with appear as characters in your, in your work, right. don't they? Now, do they know that they're in the comic books? Most of them do, yeah. Uh, and how do they feel about they that? They love it. Yeah. They like it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they like to be on your show, too. They're flattered about they're the... They're flattered, yeah, you know? Yeah. People like publicity. They yeah. think it's a big thing. Uh -huh. You know? Uh, and and uh, do all of them that are in the books know they're in the books, or some don't have any idea? A few of them don't. Most of them do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's not really, you know, very very many unflattering portraits that I've done of people. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I do stuff accurately. 
Uh, a lot of the stuff is pretty serious, actually. Yeah. Uh, some of it's humorous. Um, what I'm trying, you know, I'm focusing on everyday life, right. you know, rather than the highs and lows of people's, uh, you know, like, uh, lives. And, uh, sure. Why, why did you select the comic books as a forum for that? Why couldn't because, it have been a series of essays or articles or whatever? Because it's a, you know, it just goes along, you know, it's a wonderful medium. It's as good an artistic medium as any other medium. Um, it's, you know, it's words and pictures, and you can do anything you want with words and pictures. Yeah. It doesn't, there's no limit to how good the words can be. Yeah. There's no limit to how good the pictures can be. And, uh, but it's, you know, considered a junk medium because it's been, always been aimed at a lowest canon, you know, now a common denominator right. audience. Sure. But, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, very, you know, the potential of it has just, you know, you know, been, uh, hasn't been, hasn't been exploited to yeah. any extent. W would you, would you ever one day see yourself writing a screenplay or writing something that might reach a broader audience? Television well, show? Do you, have you ever written a t I don't TV script? No, I haven't. Uh, well, I had a play based on, uh, my comic book, uh -huh. so, but, uh, a screenplay or a you know theater play is you know very similar to you know my comic book stuff you know or a comic book script because what it involves is it involves writing dialogue yeah. and it involves you know instructions either to the actors sure. or to the uh, yeah sure yeah, or to the uh, or to relax relax right, don't worry about yeah, it I know, I'm not worried about it you don't worry about it I'm not worried about it either. I just I want to I'm, trying, I'm trying to I know you've got a job I've got a job we're All both right. very lucky okay. we both have jobs well, what's the matter? You got it. You got to go. Now, now just okay. read, Harvey, I like you. I'm on your side. All right, I, I enjoy the comic books. Okay. And, and here, quickly, tell us about the little doll. My here. wife made it. You're okay. And they're and they're. Uh... Wait, am I giving you a hard time? No, you're not giving me a hard time. Well, no, you're not making me nervous. We have to go now. And I just All wanted right. to mention that these are for sale. Yeah. They're made out of your old clothing. That's right. Yeah. And what what do these go for? Thirty-four bucks. Thirty-four dollars. Thirty-four dollars for this? What are you cheap? You cheaper than me? Well, no, but <laughs> would you pay thirty-four dollars for that? No, but I'm not asking it. My wife is. Oh, you know? I see. Uh, well, uh, we'll, excuse me. We'll do a commercial.